previously on Famicom Dojo. Did I miss something? Who's he? That means it's my brother too, right? Greetings, Rebels and Powet fans. Welcome back to Famicom Dojo for the final episode of Season 1. I'm Sean Orange from Powet.tv. And I'm Vink from Four Color Rebellion, and recently, RisingStuff.com. During this season, it has been our goal to shed some light on the history of the Famicom and the profound effects of its life cycle on the rest of the gaming world. And to get a date with that girl from Firefly. We hope we accomplished one of these goals. Which one is it? As this chapter draws to a close, we have one more major piece of hardware to cover. The Sharp Twin Famicom. The Sharp Twin Famicom. Like experiencing Zen while enjoying the art of tea. It's a twofer. Whoa, 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 hold on a minute here. How come we never mentioned them before? So, what you're saying is, I'm adapted? Eh, honto this. That actually explains a lot. Like why I don't look like Dad. Itsumo musko des. And why I can't understand a word he says. The twin Famicom is so called because it combines the original Famicom with the disk system attachment into a single unit. The largely unmodified internal hardware for each system sits side by side in a newly designed shell. Many people believe the twin Famicom is an unlicensed clone. This is not the case. Nintendo officially licensed the manufacturer of the console to Sharp Corporation in Japan. Sharp officially released the first twin Famicom on July 1st, 1986, only five months after the release of the standalone disk system unit. In the Nintendo First, the console came in two colors. Red, with a black cartridge slot, and black, with a red cartridge slot. When the twin power activate, form of Domokun! No, 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 they're actually twins? Motsuro can this day get any weirder? On the front, similar to the Famicom, we have the gray reset button, the cartridge eject lever, and the orange power button that turns on the console in either disc or cartridge mode. The disc system portion is essentially identical to its standalone counterpart. Like the Famicom, there is still no lights to indicate when the system is on. Unlike the Famicom, the eject mechanism is now a simple lever, similar to the ones later used on the Super Famicom and Super NES. However, this prototype version was unusually powerful, as Fink will demonstrate. An unadvertised but useful feature of the twin Famicom yeah, yeah. and its amazing cartridge eject system yeah, yeah. was if your friend's playing one of those two-player games, but you know, the kind of game that you gotta wait yeah. for the other guy to take a turn, but he's oh, kinda so good. good. Well, here's what you do. You take a game cartridge, you put it in the twin Famicom, oh, yeah. you aim and you shoot cartridges at the back oh. of his head. What do you know what? I'm trying Until to... Until he eventually oh. dies. So you just I'm keep firing fire the cartridges. I shield! Ow! Oh. You fire the cartridges. Oh. I crashed! This capability was sadly nerfed in the Super Famicom release. The expansion slot from the front of the Famicom is located on the right side of the twin, labeled Expansion Port A. Labeled only Expansion Port B is the mysterious port from the RAM cartridge, and we still don't know what it's used for. Underneath are two more expansion ports, labeled C and D. What are they for? The two ports are connected to each other by a proprietary cable. I thought they might be used for communication between the two halves of the system. However, removing this cable had no effect on operation in either mode. However, it's the back of the system that has the biggest changes. Instead of the Famicom's coax output, the twin has this RF converter port, for which we sadly don't have a cable. But next to that, this was the first version of the Japanese hardware to support AV jacks. This will be followed in Japan by the AV Famicom. Oh, by comparison, the original NES release had both AV and RF outputs. <laughs> but, sadly, only came in an RF variety for the updated NES 2. <laughs> Wait, NES what? Despite the new design, the twin Famicom was actually two different systems that have to interact together. 
How to sharp solve this problem? Rather than use an external RAM cartridge, the twin Famicom introduced a switch to toggle between disk and cart. Switching to disk mode will actually block the cartridge slot or prevent you from switching to disk mode when a cartridge is inserted. Uh, what else? The controls are identical except for a facelift, and that about covers it. Aren't you forgetting something? Mm, I don't think so. The Turbo Twin. If the turbo is built in, it's not cheating. Oh, you gotta be kidding me, there are two more! Oh, I'm sorry, Toto. Poof. Mugshot! Basically, the twin was just a two in one combo when it was released. But as time went on, Sharp introduced a new gimmick to raise Twin Fami sales. The Twin Fami became the first, and to date only, Nintendo console to include Turbo Fire controllers with the system. cords were also quite a bit longer. In addition to the colors, turbo controllers, and longer cords, the Turbo Twin has other differences from the first version of the Twin hardware. The molding on the top half of the case is different, replacing a beveled edge around the cartridge slot with a flat piece. Nintendo also added a light on the power button so you could tell when it's turned on or off. Another interesting thing about the Twin Famicom is that it is in fact called a Famicom rather than a family computer, which was the full name of the Japanese system. Written right on the console here is Famicom. It's not just on the system and in the documentation, but it, they've also gone as far as to change uh, the loading screen on a disk system game. And you can see it says Famicom. This is different from the original disk system screen, which said simply, Nintendo. Part of what helped Nintendo make a name for itself in the console and software market was the tight control they had over their licenses, which makes it somewhat surprising that they would turn to a third party, Sharp, to make the Twin Famicom in the first place, which was indeed a core Nintendo system. However, this would not be the last time Nintendo would turn to another company to develop an integral piece of hardware. Well, it's hard to believe, but that's all the time we have for Season 1. Thank you so much for all of those who helped make this possible, especially you, the viewer. Me? If you're watching the netcast, be sure to check out our Denshi Mail promo. For everyone else, stick around after the credits for a special announcement from the future of Famicom Dojo. Until then, this is Sean Orn signing off until 2009. And this is Vink telling you to make sure you come back for our new season and have a safe and happy holidays. See you next year. Next season on Famicom Dojo. So I'm alone. I don't have anyone. You have your freaky quadruped family, and I'm the blinking red-headed stepchild. Moshiwaki gozaimasen! I've had enough of this. I'm leaving. And there ain't nothing... Oh, what now? Daddy? Oh, hell no! Howdy fans, John Orange here again. Wanted to thank you one more time for watching Famicom Dojo. I hope you enjoyed the season finale. Uh, that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, next year we're going to start up with all new episodes. Uh, but until then we have a special treat. We finally have a name for the mailbag. So next year, starting in January, Vic and I will be putting out two Denshi Mail videos per month. So how are you going to watch these new videos? Have you been watching the netcast? If not, why the heck not? We put a lot of work into that thing, so check it out on iTunes, or check it out on our fantastic new website, FamicomDojo.tv, and pick a feed reader of your choice. The Video Netcast is the place to go for information about Famicom Dojo, as well as the cleaned up and finalized versions of all of our videos. If that seems like a lot to keep track of, you'll log on to the website, FamicomDojo.tv. 
4CR and Howl.TV are still the places to go to get the newest episodes of Famicom Dojo. But FamicomDojo.tv is the place to go to find all the ones you missed. Links to the show notes on Powit.tv and your choice of video format. YouTube, game trailers, the netcast, even Facebook, and anything else that we come up with in the future. We'll also be releasing specials throughout the year, like our TGS coverage and our Wii Launch Day special. Sending your questions via email to DenshiMail at FamicomDojo.tv. If you're on YouTube, make a video response. Or otherwise, just try and get a hold of us and we'll try and put your video and your question on our show. Until then, keep watching Powit.tv for many great shows, including the new game series Keep Playing, which you'll see me on occasionally. And keep reading 4ColorRebellion.com for all of your Nintendo news. Last but not least, check out RisingStuff.com for all of your Japanese video game needs, where you can get your hands on your very own Famicom. So that's it. Have a safe and wonderful new year, and we will see you in January.